tick self, or at least how I did and the benefits that I got from it and how it's changed my life. And hopefully something that I've gone through will be of use to other people. I should start by saying that I have ADHD, I'm autistic, and I have some amount of PTSD, although my therapist tells me it's hard to tell because all of these conditions have overlapping symptoms. So hooray. Um, I did not learn that about myself until I was in my 40s, by the way. And wow, I could have used some coping mechanisms before that. I mean, I had coping mechanisms, just better coping mechanisms. So anyway, today I want to talk about um, sort of the process I went through, which in, in a nutshell starts with accepting myself, uh, coming out as myself, understanding myself, because you don't actually really understand yourself until you start living the way that you want to live. And you realize like, oh, I had some thoughts and pre preconceived notions in here that didn't that I can actually get rid of now. Um, <clears throat> I am in my 40s, Robin. I'm 45. Um, and then, of course, finally coming into my the real my, real version of myself and then revealing myself. So I do have a couple of trigger warnings I'm going to throw out here. I do talk a bit about the role that fundamental religion had in my process and my life. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, being trans and some of the troubles trans people go through. And then I'm going to brush up against some stuff about the kink community, but nothing, nothing remotely, nothing beyond PG-13 there or anything like that. Um, so I think I should also, I'll start off with the religion thing and say like the, I grew up evangelical Christian, but not like Southern Baptist evangelical, um, Western Canadian, German evangelical, which is sort of a spinoff of like Lutheran and Mennonite. Uh, if you're not familiar with those, they're like kind of like Amish, but they could use technology. Um, sorry. I'm just, just enjoying reading the, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, living your best life does give you eternal youth. I swear I looked like I was in my fifties before I came out. Um, so that's sort of, I, and I, and I do have some thoughts on religion. I'm going to sort of keep my opinions out of this and just sort of talk about the results of how religion and I got along with each other. I do also think that some of my issues with religion are due to being autistic and not understanding that I see things as black and white and literal and perhaps they weren't meant to be black and white and literal. Um, so, you know. <laughs> you guys have the funniest comments. Uh, you can take the queer out of the Mennonite church, but you can't take the Mennonite church out of the queer. All right. So um, when I was, you know, what I thinking back, and this is actually something I didn't remember until um, I started like writing out sort of my process, my life I went through to get here. I, I remember the first time that I was sort of taken aback by the whole gender thing. I was six years old. We had just moved to a new city and I was helping my mother sort of put, put up her, set up her jewelry and her shoes <clears throat> and her makeup. And I was kind of playing with it all. And I remember saying to her um, that I can't wait until I can have makeup and shoes and uh, pretty shoes and, and all this jewelry and whatnot, you know, when I grow up to be a woman. And my mother gave me this look and said, you're not going to grow up to be a woman. You're going to grow up to be a man. And I was like heartbroken. I was like, wait, seriously, I have to grow up and be a man. Like I was not prepared for that. Nothing against men at all. It just wasn't, wasn't the right thing, you know? Um, and, and after my parents got divorced, I actually started to be able to like explore that a little bit more and, Something about the way and this, anyone who's like followed me on social media will not, will not be surprised by this, but I like wearing tight clothing. I'm pretty sure it's in some way tied to my autism. Some people who have autism can't stand things touching them. Me, I need to be like encased all the time. I remember being a kid um, and being like, anytime I was like uncertain of things or, or sort of scared or whatever, I would go underneath my bed and my bed like had a bunch of stuff under it as all kids beds do. And I would pile push more things under there like blankets, whatnot. And I would basically create this cocoon and I would do that until I could just barely fit until like I was running the risk of being trapped under there kind of thing. Cause it just felt so good to be, um, liberal at night. <laughs> I guess that would be liberal at night. Sorry. I was distracted by the comments there. I mean, we always had this joke growing up, you know, why can't, uh, why don't evangelicals have sex? Or, sorry. Yeah. Why don't evangelicals have sex standing up? Because it might need lead to dancing, you know. Um, but I had a lot of friends who were in a variety. We actually had people called Hutterites who lived near us who were just like the Amish, but they can use technology for farming. And that was an interesting experience as well. But um, so for me, living authentically, 
has a lot to do with being transgender and also a lot to do with my peculiar peculiar love of fashion um, and the kinds of things I love to wear and the way I like to present myself. I remember being 10 or 11 years old. I was on my grandparents' farm up in Western Canada where we had one television station um, and it was usually fuzzy, but it wasn't that night. It was New Year's Eve and we were there's this New Year's Eve party on TV and this woman came out on stage and she was wearing this silver spandex sparkly cat suit and she was like, as one did in the late eighties, you know, she was wearing um, like a, basically like a bikini over top, like a hot pink spandex bikini over top. And I just looked at that and thought like, that's amazing. I want to be that. Like that just looks like the way I want to dress and the way I want to be. I also look comfortable and enjoyable and whatnot. And I've, through my years, I, I've always loved seeing, you know, it's, it, this sounds might sound a little odd at first seeing women wearing tight clothing and you're like well yeah so do a lot of other people but the thing is and i didn't even realize this was a thing until i was a lot older i never wanted to like be with them i wanted to be them right like it was always that i wanted that like that was like i want to look like that i want to be that person or have something of what they have um and i went on yearning like that for quite a while i um up until my very early 40s probably 41 i would have told you that i'm not transgender um, yet every night I would go to bed dreaming of actually waking up a woman and finally being a woman, but I didn't believe I was transgender. And the the reason um, I, I this is this is going to sound um, tongue in cheek at first, but um, the reason why I I think the, the the main reason why I got thrown back so much is Maury Povich. I'm just going to lay a ton of blame at Maury Povich's feet. He doesn't really fully deserve all the blame I'm about to give him, but he did so many shitty things. So I think we can lay a lot of blame at Maury Povich's feet. Like, holy, like, ex exploitationist. Exploitationer? Exploitative? Something like that. Um, so this one episode, I'm, I'm home after school watching TV and Maury Povich is on. And these four or maybe five beautiful women come out on stage and they're all wearing bikinis and they look amazing. You know, and they're posing and all that. And, um, you know, the audience is cheering and catcalling as audiences do. Um, and there's some triggering language in this, but I'm just sort of quoting. Um, Maury Povich says, um, which one of these women is actually a man? Which is already triggering. Like now I can barely even say that without thinking like that poor person. And it turns out it was poor persons because the punchline was that all of them were trans. And he said, you know, his, his words were they're all men. And, and I guess maybe some of them were drag queens, but there were definitely some trans people in there. And I came away from that experience thinking that is a thing that I can never be, you know, that's, that's some sort of ideal. Maybe they were born that way or something. And I just, I'm just not, I can't be that. And at the same time thinking like, wow, I don't want to be a circus freak. That's just carted out for some like oohs and ahs and stuff like that. And a little bit of shock, you know, um, that didn't sound fun either. And then on top of that, you know, every other portrayal of trans people in the media at the time, was a joke you know we were always the punchline it got a little bit better in the 90s you know with like uh chandler's um well they call it in the in the show was chandler's father and chandler referred to this person as her father but um their father was transgender and um which a lot of trans people i know actually let their kids continue to call them by the old name so it's not entirely unreasonable but um but they had a woman playing the trans character which nowadays is kind of frowned upon right because there's trans um, actors and actresses and and I don't know what the non-binary kind of actor is all of a sudden. Anyway, but be just actor. Um, but at the time, they had a woman playing, playing um, the, the character, and in a way that was kind of nice because it wasn't a character caricature. It wasn't a mockery, exactly, and that was actually kind of refreshing. But like that was like the best representation that we got. Uh, would still be actor. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, totally landed there. Um, and so, so that sort of sets the stage for where I was. Um, at the time, I was I was kind of traumatized by the media. I didn't. I thought the trans people were disgusting because they looked disgusting, because that's how they were portrayed. And I think there was some internalized disgust going on. And of course, growing up in the religious household that I grew up in, um, you know, it was it was also frowned upon, obviously. And I started. I made. I don't know if it's a mistake or not. I did a thing that I, that most people don't do. When I got my first Bible, um, people were like, yeah, you should start reading in the beginning of the New Testament. I'm like, well, that seems weird. Who would start reading a book from near the end? I'll start at the beginning. And by the time I was like 12 or 13 years old, I'd read the Old Testament four or five times, the New Testament two or three times at least. And 
you know, I read all these verses, you know, like, you know, men shall not sleep with men and men shall not wear women's clothing and so on and so forth. And, and it internalized a lot of that. And at the same time, you know, the church had taught me that, um, I'm sort of vaguely keeping up with comments. Um, the church has taught me, taught me that, you know, our nature is evil and sin. And I didn't want my, my nature was to not be what I was. And so I, I, connected that with my with something evil and felt like that was an evil thing inside of me and fought against that for the next 25 years um i went through interesting phases like i i discovered on top mainly because i saw that woman when i was like 11 10 or 11 years old wearing that that silver spanx cat suit i wanted to get some for myself and as a very revol- resourceful 13 14 year old i got my hands on spandex cat suits and i loved them because they softened my body and they made it look more feminine and I love that. And I went through like these phases in my teenage years where I would get like a bunch of women's clothing and I'd be terrified someone was going to find it and I would just burn it all, um, which once or twice almost caused really bad problems <laughs> by, by burning a bunch of clothing in the backyard. Um, so I had I had a lot of religious trauma I had to come over, get over. And like I said, um, had I been in a different church in a different environment, I might not have had this had I not been autistic and like undiagnosed, I might not have had these particular issues. It's, it's, you know, I'm not coming down a religion or anything like that. In, in particular, I have a lot of amazing Christian friends who are super supportive and lovely people. But for me, this is just the process that I went through. Um, and so, you know, through the, so this was like, you know, in my, I got married when I was 19 and luckily Jill was really accepting of me being the way I am. She refers to herself, by the way, as Lois Lane in this situation. She had like no idea that I was trans until I told her yet. I haven't owned like men's pants since 2000, year 2000, you know, and I only came out three and a half, four years ago. So, and that was a sort of like one of the ways I was trying to express myself because inside of myself was this burning desire to be the authentic version of Mallory, um, even though I believed that it was evil. So I was trying to like somehow, I was trying to like, you know, walk the line, right? Like, can I wear women's clothing in a way that maybe people won't notice? Because there's lots of women's pants that you can wear, kind of get away with it. No one's really gonna know. They might be a little bit tight around the hips and the butt, but I always thought my butt looked nice. So I didn't have a problem with that. But you know, and then every now and then I would feel ashamed of the fact that I was doing this and I would go through these cycles. Um, and I developed a really keen sense of self-loathing and I sort of got more and more into religion in the church, hoping that finally I would come across the thing that would fix me. Right. And I would, I would discover this relationship with God that would finally fix me and not make me trans. Little did I know the Bible actually has absolutely nothing to say about trans people. As it turns out, um, all of the stuff where, where Paul talks about where Paul mentions people wearing the other genders clothing was in connection <clears throat> with um, orgies, um, practice and worship of other gods, and things like the fact where Paul, uh, in, in, where Paul mentions, uh, talks speaks against homosexuality. Well, that was added to the Bible, like in the late forties. Um, Paul specifically said soft boys, and as it turns out, like in, the Greeks were all about gay sex, right? So they had words for gay sex. Um, he was speaking about people who basically um, traded in and um availed themselves of young boys for sex so what he was paul was speaking out against and even like in the old testament the hebrews actually had five possibly six genders depending on certain interpretations and some older texts suggest that where the bible says men shall not lay with men and, and so on and so forth it was just saying don't have sex with your male relatives it wasn't wasn't actually speaking out against homosexuality i don't that's very much up for debate but it was really interesting to learn that the things i've been taught is that were incontrovertible truth were a little more flexible than I'd learned. I unfortunately learned all of that after I came out, not before. Um, so I had to basically deconstruct um, everything that I believed with religion. And the really interesting thing was that if you would ask me, like I said, up until you know um, the very beginning, like even January of 2019, I would have told you I wasn't trans. I would have said I love women's fashion and I love expressing myself, but I wasn't trans. Um, I did luckily have a lot of outlets, you know, I worked from home, um, especially then because I've been a full-time writer for two, a little over two years at that point. Uh, so I kind of dressed how I wanted to. I had actually gotten used to wearing leggings in public, even though I was presenting as, as a male at the time. And part of it was just, I just 
hated wearing jeans. I just, they felt like cardboard. Even women's jeans felt, I mean, they're softer now, but even back then, a lot of them were kind of cardboardy. I loved wearing leggings. And I wasn't like showing anything off. I was like, you know, wearing good underwear and long shirts and stuff like that. I just felt more comfortable in leggings. And for the longest time, like if someone came to the door or rang the doorbell, I would like run to my room and quickly pull on a pair of jeans because I was ashamed of who I was and what I was. And I was always worried. I spent an inordinate amount of time every day worrying that someone was going to discover this deep, dark secret about me, that this this internal thing that was horrible and detestable was going to be laid bare. It consumed my mind, you know, between between worrying about people figuring out that I was I was this this freak, is how I thought of myself, and also like wishing that I wasn't a man. I probably consumed like two to three hours every single day, not like solid. But throughout the day with my thoughts caught up in those issues, it was it was a, an all consuming thing for decades. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I have, I have all sorts of thoughts with Bob Paul, too. I'm with you guys are you guys are with me. Well, yeah, good underwear. I, I, I heard this one thing where this girl was talking about Comic Cons and she's like, I've never once seen Peter Parker's dong. So like, guys, wear good underwear if you want to cosplay him properly. <laughs> Anywho, um, so. On top of that, like one of the the outlets that I got was because I I like Titan shiny clothing. Um, it's obvious that I I found myself easing into into fetish types of things. Like my first exposure to latex was of course uh, Michelle Pfeiffer wearing it in Batman Returns, which I can't believe she did because latex is not an easy thing to wear when you're being physically active or doing much of anything actually. Um, but uh, but I loved it. I thought it looked amazing. And, and you know, like if you're into things that are tight and shiny, latex is the pentultimate tight and shiny things. I mean, it doesn't have to be tight though, because the jacket is actually made of latex as well. So you can you can actually have some cool fashion in the mix too. But um, what I discovered is that the kink community was a lot less concerned about what you were supposed to be and um, and 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 how you presented. And the, sort of the underlying thought was like, we're all a bunch of deviants anyway so who cares <laughs> and you know the good thing was that it was an outlet for me the bad thing was that they they embrace in many circles not all they embrace the idea of being deviant and perverted and that didn't really help my whole i'm evil problem that i was having that much but it did give me an outlet i've actually never gone to a kink event or anything like that i just sort of like tend peripherally was associated with it i really am kind of a little bit more for um the fashion you know although it's you know nice clothing can look nice on a person too so it's it's a little bit of this a little bit of that um and writing was also uh another outlet for me as well i'm just, I'm just you guys have such interesting comments i really you guys have lived amazing lives i love the idea of being in a close tribe with two partners and raising kids that's like a beautiful thing um yeah i know it's kind of shocking that i've never been to a, a, a kink event it just never seemed to work out. And the other thing too is I just sort of, well, I'm going to get to the next, the next part of the why for that um, in a little bit. And of course, another thing too is that writing was an outlet for me. I remember the uh, the first time I sat down to really start writing some science fiction. And I'm just like, I'd written male characters quite a bit before when I wrote fantasy before I started writing sci-fi. But I read so much, almost all the sci-fi I've read growing up was written by women, which is sort of an unusual experience for most people. And so it just was a no-brainer that my main character would be a woman. Um, and I really, I, well, I'm, in my books, any book that I wrote with the exception of three that a, a publisher wanted me to have a male main character, um, the, the main characters are female. Um, some of the co-authored ones I've written, there, there are male main characters, but in the ones I've written, the main characters are always female and it just seemed natural to me. And I actually got a lot of people say, thanking me for writing women in a realistic way um as as they're as in as whole and empowered people on their own um and a lot of people thought i was a woman which i thought was amazing i was like super happy about that um but also because i wanted to do it justice right like i didn't want it to come off as men writing women not that there's anything wrong with men writing women i'm referring to like the the um the subreddit um but uh you know so i i had gone through all of that and at this point i had been been living at living not living home working from home for two years as a full-time author i've been like kind of like sort of out like i was wearing leggings in public and i was kind of presenting really gender fluidly at that point um i had stopped going to church because i'd begun deconstructing my belief in religion part of that came from writing science fiction and studying the universe um had an impact on that as well um 
and I am I am a secular humanist now, um, and also an atheist. But atheism is, is a definition of what you're not. It's not a definition of what you are. So I'm, I'm a secular. Uh, her boobs bounce boobily. I saw a tweet the other day where someone said, "Yesterday I ran downstairs, and it turns out they're right. My boobs did bounce boobily. <laughs> it was it was it was delightful. Um, so I'd I'd gotten as well into cosplay, and cosplay was where I kind of got to be for the very first time, kind of just freely myself. And what I found, and so my greatest fear, as I alluded to before, was that if people figured out the real who the real me was. I would be shunned and kicked out of society and made to live in a box, you know, in a van down by the river kind of thing, you know. Um, and I didn't want that. So, and of course, I had a wife and a daughter. And I didn't want to lose them either. Um, so I'd, I'd always hidden these aspects of myself. But when I started doing cosplay, I got to be a little bit more open because the cosplay community is much more forgiving of, you know, gender bending um, certain things and, and gender bending anything, actually, for that matter. And just being yourself. You know, and as long as you're having fun, no one really cares, you know, what what you what you're supposed to look like versus what you're cosplaying. That's the whole point, right? It's it's this free self-expression. And that sort of all started to compound to the point where I'm like, maybe actually there's there's another thing I learned too. And that was when I was wearing leggings in public and and you know, I was like wearing eyeliner and um and like ankle boots and like but I was only wearing women's clothing. Although sometimes I still had a beard, which I'm sure looked weird to a lot of people. But basically the thing that I came away from was no one really cared, which at the same time I was like, well, you guys should care. Like I look really cool, but they just, no one really cared. If, and if they did care, they didn't care enough to say anything about it. Uh, maybe sometimes some people would, would actually, the more gay looking I got, the more people would compliment my outfits, uh, which was an interesting experience as well. Um, and uh, I remember this is like another segue. Um, this was Jordan Con in 2019 was sort of a one of my first coming out types of experiences. And I didn't know what I was going to call myself at that point. So I was just going by M. And I remember being a little bit drunk, laying on a table on the final night when they have the big dance. And um, someone said, I think I'm gay for M. And then the other person said, I think everyone's gay for M. And that was like such an awesome feeling that I got. Because I'd never felt desirable. I'd never felt like I was attractive because whenever I looked in the mirror, I thought it was horrible. Um, I became very good at doing just about everything without looking in the mirror. Like I went years without looking in the mirror. I could shave perfectly without looking in the mirror. Um, so that was like sort of like, wow, like I could actually be like desirable as a human being right now. You wouldn't, you know, Dana, there's actually a couple of women I follow who are wear latex and do a lot of fetishy things on Instagram. I think they look amazing. Um, but that's, I do understand that, that there are things that are not available to everybody. I totally get that, 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 um, I am actually very privileged. Um, and I don't, I don't deny that. I'm definitely the, the 1% of trans people. Um, I do my best to remind myself of that as, as much as possible. And of course I had the advantage of appearing to be a blonde haired, blue eyed white man for a very long time, which also gave me a lot of advantages in life. But boy, when I came out as trans, did I realized that um, I had I didn't I didn't understand what privilege was before because I didn't I never I never not had it. I always had it, you know. And then once I lost it, I was like, oh god. <laughs> so now my new policy is if someone says that they're marginalized, I'm like, okay, I believe you. Um, that's a bit of a segue. So um, the, the cosplay thing led me to this woman who um, I wanted to do better makeup because I was terrible at makeup back then. I, I looked like a clown at best um, when I did makeup. And she tr teaches trans people how to do makeup. And I went there saying like, hey, I'm not trans. I just want to do better makeup for cosplay. Although I, like, I'm sure she was like, sure, whatever. Because I show up wearing like this nice tunic top, um, a pair of shiny leggings and ankle boots, you know, that sort of thing. But whatever. I was in the levels of self-denial that I was <laughs> living under were, were extreme. So anyway, she did my makeup and taught me how to do it. And then she also sells wigs. So she put a wig on. And um, I, I remember walking over to a mirror and standing in front of it. And I took pictures of this thing, Scott, because that was the first time I ever looked in a mirror and saw myself. And that was that was it. That was the moment where I let the genie out of the bottle. And there was no going back. Um, I knew that I could not live my life appearing to be a man anymore. It wouldn't work. And if I was forced to, 
it wouldn't work if you get what I'm saying. Um, but I still was filled with fear because I, I was afraid I would lose my readership. I write military science fiction. The majority of my readership are men who live in the southeastern United States and a lot of trans and lesbian women too. I actually, I actually created this special little bubble on the internet where all those people get along. It's kind of neat. But um, I was afraid of using my, my, losing my readers, losing my family, losing my, my wife and daughter, losing everything. I was afraid of like ending up in a van down by the river and being this, this freak that was paraded out, you know, for people to laugh at. Um, <laughs> it does come with the echo of joy of Jemis remembered. You're absolutely right, Maggie. Um, <laughs> Monty, I get that. I get that. Um, so I, uh, I had some really hard conversations with my wife and our marriage almost came to an end on a couple of occasions. Uh, thankfully it didn't. We, we felt that we had too much to let go of it all over, over that and that we would figure out a way forward. And we did, and I'm exceptionally glad that we did. And our relationship now is better than it ever has been. Um, it's like we're closer because we're just completely honest with each other. There isn't like a hidden thing. There's no lie between us. Um, and I did lose half my readers and I did lose half my family. Um, but the people that I got in place of them are so much better. And it's, it's so much more fulfilling. And that's the thing that like, I know it's not, doesn't go this way for every trans person. But I do talk to a lot of trans people who are very happy with the, the new people that come into their lives after they come out. And not just trans people, but people who are coming out for all sorts of things. You know, when they start being their authentic self and their real self, the people that come to you and are around you are just so much better than the people before. And what I came to realize and what I told myself was that, why are you pretending to be something else for people who would hate the real you? And I hopefully that's useful to somebody because, you know, why am I appeasing someone who would hate me? That is, is kind of crazy to think about. At least to me, it's crazy. Um, and I just decided not to do it anymore. So, the you know, I, I actually entered into, I came out in May 31st of 2019. I entered into like this, this new season of growth in my life. I discovered so many new friends. I lost a lot of friends, even friends who had kind of been with me through my transition, um, kind of eventually decided they weren't keen on, on this new version of me and, and faded away. Um, but I got so many new friends. I built up my readership again. I, I, I really took off in the writing community as a speaker and as a presenter and someone who just like was looked up to and offered people advice. Um, and I, in places interesting that you wouldn't expect because I write military science fiction, but I kind of got kicked out of that club. That's not to say completely, but there's lots of military science fiction writers who won't give me the time of day anymore. And some of them who are actually have liberal politics, but pretend not to, so they don't lose their readership and they have distanced themselves from me as well. But what kind of happened um, as, as this went on is I still felt that I was keeping a secret and that was that I'm a kinky bitch. Um, <laughs> I'm actually not really that much of a kinky bitch. Well, maybe I am, but it's mostly like I wanted, I wanted to, it always felt wrong to me, and this is probably to a certain extent my autism coming out, that like, for example, we can be practically naked on the beach, but we can't be anywhere else. Like, I still have trouble with that as a society that we make these weird distinctions about like how much we can wear and how we can present ourselves and what we can do. And we have so much context and location-based stuff around it that as an autistic person, I can't quite follow. But to me, it was like, I don't want to make it so that I have to hide the fact that I love wearing latex and cat suits and things like that. I want to be able to wear them wherever I go because that's the real me. Um, so when pandemic happened, I, I knew that something that I knew I had like no choice, but to, to do something drastic, um, naked on a spaceship. <laughs> that's, yeah, that, that discussion totally happened. Um, so, I mean, cause right close. If you, I saw this thing that actually said that if you were to like take a starship and fly it to Andromeda, the amount of energy required to produce clothing and the amount of extra weight the clothing would take over the course of this journey would be terrible. It would be a lot. It was like a tremendous amount of energy and waste. So like, just don't wear clothing, you know, make the starship comfortable and don't wear clothing. Anyway, um, where was I going from here? Right. So I knew that going into pandemic that if I didn't like, if I let myself slide, things were going to go badly. I would end up in depression. I would end up, um, who knows what would have happened to me. So I knew that every day I had to get dressed up, you know, and look fancy, look, put myself together 
And then to make sure I did it, I started this thing where basically every day I did like a two hour photo shoot uh, when pandemic kicked off. And I started doing some of the, the shoots in my latex cat suits. And I got started getting really comfortable with that. And I realized like, hey, no one, like no one, no one has ever called me out for it. Um, except for like on TikTok. But like in my in my real life and with people I know on Facebook, I've never once had someone say, like, you shouldn't be wearing that. That's that's you know, fetish gear um, or something like that. Because and my argument when people do say that is like, well, people wear leather jackets just to wear them and people wear leather for other reasons. And that doesn't make the fabric inherently a thing. But anyway, um, it I got to actually finally be my full self in front of everybody, you know, and I do calls with clients who've never met me before wearing like rubber cat suits and stuff like that. And they all just think it's freaking amazing. And people started to say this thing to me I mean, they started to say it to me pretty much right away, but they started to say it a lot to me as I sort of came out that way. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, we're going too far on this. We're going too far on this, Dana. <laughs> um, yeah, if it's overly sexualized stuff, I would agree. Like if you're walking around with a strap on as an extreme example. That's not cool. Um, I keep it classy. That's sort of my goal. Um, I, I do respect that I don't want to include other people who non non-consensually in fetishistic things that's that's a different scenario entirely but um but what i what i came to realize or one thing that started to happen is people started to call me brave and i was like i'm not brave i did this so that i didn't end up killing myself like i had to come out there was no choice um but as people started to say i was brave about my fashion i'm like okay well that wasn't going to be a life or death thing and i started to realize that what people really meant whenever someone came up to me and told me they were brave maybe not all the time but most of the time it probably meant that they had something in their life that they wished they could do that they could come out about uh, some some way that they are living inauthentically and wish they could be authentic that they weren't able to do and so they saw me as brave and i used to tell people like no i'm not brave stop calling me that but i used to say to, now i say to them like you can be brave too um because i believe that people can and i think that we all feel like we're going to be judged for all sorts of things about ourselves. And the truth is that if we're not hurting anybody, people mostly just don't care. <laughs> They're just not concerned with what we wear or how we present. Now, some people are exceptionally concerned for reasons that actually kind of befuddle me. But generally speaking, I guess this does depend on where you live. I am also very fortunate that I live in the Northeastern United States, which is one of the most queer friendly places on planet Earth. Um, it has the highest percentage of queer people on planet Earth as well. Um, so it's, I was also, like I said, very fortunate about that. But one of the things that is sort of tied in with that is, um, yeah, that's a great way to put it. Um, Ritika, I think I'm saying that right. Um, yeah, living instead of existing is, is, it's the way to do it, quite honestly. But something that I'd always done, and this is actually, actually, to be honest, a really good side effect of religion is I never, I've never been a gossip. I mean, I've engaged in gossip sometimes because it's very tempting. But I've never generally gossiped. I never talk badly about people behind their back. Um, and I've always sort of cultivated this sort of drama-free bubble around myself. And I used to run software development teams. And people always referred to my team as the drama-free team. There was never any drama on my team. Everybody just got along. And was, I think it was because I created this judgment-free zone where people could be themselves and they could feel that they weren't going to be judged. And therefore, they were less judgy of other people as well. Because I think a lot of people do it as, as a defense mechanism. Um, and that transitioned along with me where people started to see me living as this authentic person. Um, yeah, I can totally see that, e, that you do that. Um, people saw me leave, living as this authentic person who, who basically, I, I joked, I used to joke that I live in a glass house made of glass houses. But the thing that comes out of that, the thing that comes out of being totally authentic and being 100% yourself and laying yourself bare at all times is that no one can hold anything against you. You become unassailable because there's there's no secret that you're harboring that makes you feel weak, that makes you feel vulnerable. I'm, I'm invulnerable. I mean, yes, I could be harmed in a, in a variety of ways, but I can't be harmed by any part of myself being revealed. I don't have like that internal fear anymore that someone's going to learn my deep, dark secret and I'm going to be living in the van down by the river. Um, I, I can just fully be myself and... And I got strength from all the people that respected that. And I came to realize like, hey, like if there are, there, there are haters out there, but wow, they're the minority. And there are so many people that are attracted to, to 
me being authentic, but I started to think like, what does authentic really mean? And when you boil it down, um, what does what does authenticity mean, and how does it actually like exist as a thing? And what I realized is that authentic authenticity is just honesty, right? And I am completely honest about who I am. I make I make no bones about it. I wear I, my my chiropractors adjusted me in latex cat suits after I asked her if she had a latex allergy ahead of time. And she thinks it's hilarious. I remember the one time I've called her up and said, like, hey, I'm wearing a rubber cat suit with a tail today. Is that going to be in the way of you doing an adjustment? And she's like, nope. And it is to this day her favorite phone conversation she's ever had. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I am completely myself. I have actually had to learn to be a little bit careful what I wear in public because sometimes I almost cause accidents. I was wearing a, um, a white, like a white widow cat suit one time going to my chiropractor and a UPS truck slowed down and a, and a USPS truck almost rear-ended him because they were both staring at me. And then later on the same day, a guy missed, almost missed a turn and crashed into a building. I'm like, Oh my God, some of these cat suits are like lethal. I better not wear them out too much. Like I'll have to wear a coat with them or something. Um, cause I don't want to cause harm obviously, but anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, white cat suits are pretty pretty, but, um, I mean, to put it really frankly, if you think about it, though, like no one wants to hang out with liars, you know, a liar is, you know, is a person who's going to stab you in the back, who's going to gossip about you. And we see that in other people. You know, we, we pay attention because one of the things that I, I learned this really early on, I don't know how I figured this out so young. I was like 17 or 18 years old when I realized this, but I realized that what someone does to someone else, given the right circumstances, they will do to you uh, without fail. You know, um, it's, all, it's only just a matter of the the circumstances being right and a behavior they will exhibit towards one person, unless they go through some sort of personal change, they will exhibit towards someone else. And I sort of used that to start to like determine who I wanted to spend my time with. And I feel like a lot of people do that um, instinctually as well. I think it's pretty normal to do that instinctually because human beings are pain avoidance systems. Um, we don't like to do things that hurt. We work pretty hard to not do things that hurt. Sometimes we're not too forward thinking about that, but we do generally work pretty hard to avoid things that hurt. hurt. We avoid danger. In fact, as a species, that's actually the scientific reason why bad news travels better than good news, because as a species, we're very good at cataloging and passing along bad information about danger, because that's how we survived. The humans who were not good at identifying danger didn't survive. They didn't reproduce. It's just sort of how, that's how natural selection actually works, right? But the things that didn't, the things that exist now are the things that worked. That's why they're here. Um, and human pain avoidance um, is the, the one of those things. Um, so, you know, we gravitate towards situations where we're not going to be in pain, where we're not going to have problems. And therefore, we, we gravitate away from people who are liars. So um, the more authentic, authentic you are, the more honest you are, the more people can see that, the more they become comfortable with you not being you know, deceitful and people prefer to be around non-deceitful people um, for all the reasons I just said. And that's really what it came down to when I realized that it's just a matter of being honest and and then in, and ensuring that that honesty um, flows into all aspects of my life so that no matter what I'm doing, I'm being honest about who I am, what I believe, where I stand on things. And also, I, I think that that honesty has manifested as well into listening a lot better. I used to not listen as well as I do now, but in being honest with myself, I have to be honest that I don't know everything and every single person in the world has something to teach me. And that caused me to become a lot more interested in just sitting quietly and listening to what other people say. I'm a very um, extroverted person and I have a lot of things going on in my head, but if you put me in a large group of people, I might not say a thing and I'll just listen the whole time, which is actually a very delightful change in myself that I'm pretty happy with. Um, you know, people ask me to talk about things, I will I will gladly do it, but I, I tend not to put it out there anymore. So that's basically the 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 culmination of of what I want to talk about is that authenticity is honesty. The more honest you are, the more people are drawn to you and want to be around you versus being around liars, which aren't really as much fun to be around. And the more comfortable you become with yourself, you become unassailable, you become happier. The happiest people are the most people who live the most authentically. Um, and to live without walls, right? We put up walls to avoid pain in our lives and to avoid have, have things that hurt us, not hurt us. But eventually, um, the walls become our weak points. And if you can live your life without walls, what you'll discover is that the support and understanding of the people around you 
is stronger than any wall could possibly be and holds you up better uh, and protects you better than any wall possibly could. So I encourage you all to, you know, find your North Star for who you want to be. If you don't feel like you're already yourself, find your find the 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 paragon of what you wish you were and what you wish you could present and start thinking about how you can move toward that and open yourself up to people that you think you can trust and you'll find that that you'll get that trust repaid but not every time there are some people who will leave you sad because they don't understand as well as you thought thought you would but you will find the people who understand and it will make you all the better and it'll make the world better so thank you very much that is that is my spiel <laughs> um and again if you guys if anyone wants to message me and um, ask me any questions about my journey you're welcome to do that i wrote a book um i want to update it actually because a lot of a lot has progressed in my life since then but uh, i wrote it towards the end of 2019 because i wanted to capture how i felt at the time it's called how wearing leggings changed my life um and it's about my my early times coming out as trans a lot more of this this stuff as well but um yeah, I'm happy to chat with with anybody about anything they want, either here or you can find me in, on Discord um, or on fa Facebook Messenger, anything like that. But thank you very much.